Okay. All right. Aloha and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Western States Genetic Services Collaborative. Today we will be hearing from the project members of the Inborn Errors of Metabolism Collaborative, or IBEMC. The IBMC collects, systematically collects information about the clinical progress of people that have conditions identified by newborn screening, focusing on inborn errors of metabolism. Data is used to learn about their survival, medical status, and long-term outcomes, and permits development of evidence-based practice in patient care. So we have three presenters today, including Susan Berry, who you can see there. Um, she is with the University of Minnesota and is the clinical co-PI for the IBEMC. And she has been involved since its inception, bringing the concept to the Region 4 Genetics Collaborative and working to develop and implement long-term outcomes for the IBEMC, first as a work group, later as a HRSA priority project, and most recently as an NIH-supported R01. We also have uh, Matt Eddick. Uh, he's joining us from the Michigan Public Health Public Health Institute, and he's been there since April of 2015, and he is the senior research scientist for the IBEMC. And also today we have Sally Heiner, who is also with Michigan Public Health Institute, and she's the IBEMC senior project coordinator and has also been with the project since its beginning with Region 4. Um, so with that introduction, I'll pass the um, phone over to Susan and she'll get us started with her presentation today. Thanks for um, everyone joining us. Um, can every, I'm hopefully everyone can hear me. Does the sound come through okay for you? Yep, the sound is good. All right, great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be able to present a little bit about this project. Um, it's been near and dear to my heart now for quite a while. And um, we're really excited about the progress we've made, and we'd like to be able to have other people um, be more aware of it and see what opportunities might exist for uh, their interest in collecting long-term follow-up data. So I'm going to do most of the presentation, um, and I, uh, my understanding is that we were kind of eight, the, the whole shebang may take about an hour, but I'm not talking that long. Um, because I'm hoping if there's a if there's a way that we could start, we could answer questions if, if that makes sense. Um, and Matt uh, and Sally will chime in. Um, they each have um, important expertise in this, um, so that's kind of why we included all of us on this. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead. So. Um, when I talk to people in genetics collaboratives, uh, the regional collaboratives, I'm preaching to the converted about what we need to do to improve care for children. Um, screening is a really uh, critical have public health activity, but it's really at its best when um, it's not just the process of doing the screening, but the activities that go beyond that. Um, they created uh, and wrote up the plans for the uh, recommended uniform screening panel. Um, they said this, and I, and I think it's really important for us to remember that, which is that newborn screening is more than testing. It's coordinated, it's comprehensive, education, screening, follow-up, diagnosis, treatment, and management, and program evaluation are all critical elements in being able to do effective newborn screening. You're only as good as the follow-up you ultimately provide and what you know about it. So, we seriously um, in um, our regional genetics collaborative, Region 4, now called Region 4 something else, Region 4 Great Lakes, I think. I can't remember. Midwest, Region 4 Midwest now is what we are. Um, and so our original project that we thought would be just great um, was to see if there was a way we could do a trial together to do something better in inborn errors of metabolism care. We got together and we put our heads together, but there were some problems in our, in our conversation. We all knew we had experience, but there isn't a lot of formal written evidence. Um, all the conditions that we take care of are, are rare, though collectively they're not that uncommon, but the common ones that uh, we, we geneticists think are common still talking about one in 10,000 people, and, and many of them are vanishingly more rare. Although they, of course, affect people at all ages, um, but they present in, in childhood and infancy, 
and that's always a com that's also a complex thing in doing research. Children are uh, ch research in children is held to a very high standard of protection, which it should, but it makes it complicated. Part was it's hard to justify doing organized trials about treatments that everybody think works. Also, who's going to pay for all this? Those were all things that were going to be problems as we thought about what we might do for a trial. Bob Steiner, um, now, now more than 10 years ago, did a really nice um, discussion of what was going to be necessary to develop this kind of evidence base. He pointed out there that we're going to have to have collaboration and that we're going to require support to encourage this, that know what evidence-based medicine is before they can create an evidence base. The better precision of terminology, we have to call the same things, and we're still all working on that. And many of you are probably involved in New Steps and um, some of the other projects that are trying to get everybody to use the same terms to describe all of the things that we want to do to take care of things. And of course, everybody has to publish the stuff they do because if they don't, you know, it's like writing a chart uh, for medical care. If you don't write it up, it didn't happen. If you don't publish your information, it didn't happen. So these are all critical elements for management. He thought be brilliant and clever and try and do this using a uniform protocol. And we thought that MCAD deficiency was just the ticket for it. Um, when we started, um, we kind of extrapolated that we'd have 70 new babies <coughs> in four. And we all pretty much knew that the most important thing you could do for a baby with MCAD deficiency was to prevent fast. But everybody else, when we sat down to decide about other elements, people said, carnitine, I never give carnitine, or carnitine, why wouldn't you give carnitine, and so on. Um, cornstarch, diet modification, there were a number of pieces that were anecdotal, with that, but we really couldn't come to any conclusion about a uniform protocol. So we decided that we needed something else. So I'm going to kind of walk you through what happened and how it evolved. And now I'm kind of going back to some old information I'm going back. Well, so it was a great idea, but we really couldn't pull this off as a uniform concept. And the other thing we realized as we started talking about what we were going to do is that we really don't know what the natural, and I don't even, it's not natural because we interfered with natural history by doing pre, uh, newborn screening. Thank goodness. But we don't know what the clinical course over time is. And so you need essentially a base so that you know what happens if you apply new treatment protocols. We had a lot of really smart clinicians who knew a lot about taking care of kids. And so we wanted to take, or take advantage of that. So we figured out that gathering uniform data and assessing our clinical practice differences was one way to learn, out, learn about which treatment affected strategies would affect it. So from the beginning, there's some important things to remember, that this is research and that, um, that it's based on, on our clinical needs um, and that it was going to require a lot of cooperation. It comes back to some of those themes. So we created the inborn errors of metabolism information system. It was a very brave thing for us to call it because it only really was one thing when we started. We got together um, and created an initial data set include sort of demographic information. That's all the things you need to know about every kid that would have a, a, an inherited metabolic disorder or any other newborn screen disease. What's their name? What's their, where are they from? You know, when, when were they, this is just a newborn screening data, things that every, you're going to need to know about every kid. Then we also knew, recognized that each condition was going to have stuff you wanted to know about it. So we started with that one disorder, but we did it really with a lot of, um, intentionality because we wanted to have um, a framework for building other disorders. Um, we tried and from the beginning had the idea that these things we wanted to learn about would be hypothesis driven. So we defined some of the issues for both short and long term follow up that we thought would be important to us as clinicians and to our partners, public health. Um, the initial committee was set up so that we had one public health representative and one clinician from every state. And that was really critical to the genesis of the, of the data. We made a plan for how to add additional disorders and we decided to have a way that we could um, access the information on a web base so that we would be able to maintain it relatively easily and it would be relatively accessible. We also decided to seek prospective informed consent for the research activity we were doing 
We wanted to have continuing contact with the subjects um, because we thought this could be a platform for research trials. But the, the, the in, inherent in our data set is that it's not complete in its ascertainment because if a family says, no, I don't want you to collect my data, we can't, we don't. And so there's a little element of a challenge for somebody who wants to do this specifically for public health where they are entitled to, for public health purposes, to have a complete denominator. We don't have a complete denominator. Um, this is a shorthand for pages and pages of lists of things that I could have for data elements, but just so you have a sort of snapshot. We have demographics. We collect information about the child's presentation and initial care plans when we first enroll the child. That's done at intake. Um, at subsequent visits, we collect information about follow-up st uh, status, lab testing, um, in intervening emergency care and hospitalizations, development, um, what care coordination is going on, are they going to see an ophthalmologist, a cardiologist, dentist, things like that, um, what medicines they're on to treat their disorder, and what nutrition factors are being used. Um, this kind of summarizes a little bit what she said at the beginning. We started out, and now it's, we started in 2004 with the project but really began data entry nearly ago now. Um, we had initial support through HRSA, through our Region 4 Priority 2 project, and so we're able to add additional centers um, from other regional genetic collaboratives. So we have um, a number of centers from the Heartland region and from NIMAC. And then we're successful in uh, competing for um, NIH funding and um, continued to expand the data set until we had all of the inborn errors um, that are on the recommended uniform screening panel. This was coming along at the same time as a project that was being uh, sponsored by the National Coordinating Center of uh, Genetic Collaboratives and the Newborn Screening Translational Research Network. And committees on both of those uh, projects were uh, interested in this information as well, so we took advantage of One that. The world can multitask. And um, you won't be here tomorrow. Well, I won't be here anyways. But so have a good you're day. live. If more. Matt. Yes. You're live. Oh, thank you. It says I'm muted. Sorry. I'll try to figure that out. Thanks. Um. So the um. The the. Cities. Uh, we're able to draw on the expertise of, um, of genetics uh, experts uh, in, from all over the country to look at the data sets that we had initially created to refine and sharpen and um, really focus those and create a data set that we now know as the longitudinal pediatric data resource. This is important because this is the exact data set uh, we're collecting information in. We began collection using our own data set and a commercial product. And then in 2013, we trans, uh, we, uh, I think the best word is translated, we moved all of our data into the LPDR data set framework. And so at this point, that's, that's how we're doing it. And so it's this, I want to really um, call out the collaborative effort of all of these groups as well as um, of the clinical experts who participated in creating the longitudinal pediatric data resource. So that's what the IBMC uses for its data collection now. At this point, um, when we created these elements to start with and in the subsequent refinement, this was based on treatment protocols, data sets, um, literature review, expert opinions. We tried to capture differences in data style in, in, in how people, in, in how people do their uh, clinical work instead of prescribing how it should be done. Um, it's hard to do that because if you go in and you say, hmm, someone else does this, should I be doing that? So it's hard not to influence treatment, but to the, to the extent we could, we wanted to capture what people were really doing instead of telling them how to do it. Um, the ascertainment primarily happens at clinic visits, though some centers uh, touch base with families by mail if it's been a little while. And it turns out to be a sample of convenience because it says it's whoever says yes, and what, what patients are in clinic. Um, we use a web-based password-protected data entry system. It's held behind a secure firewall. Our instance of REDCap, that is the data collection tools, is housed on secure servers at the Michigan Public Health Institute. 
All right, so this kind of gives you a little bit of a snapshot of, of the sequence. This really ends in uh, January of 2016. Um, so there are additional, we've actually pushed over 2,000 cases that on which active data collection is being done. Um, I don't have 2008 and 2000 and 2007 and 2008 on here because they're teeny tiny little bars and we didn't actually collect the information in a way that would help us with this, this grid. But what you can see is that we've had really excellent ascertainment of NCAD, our original target disorder. When we added PKU, it became a very important component of the, um, of the data collection because it's a very one of the more common disorders. Um, but we have, I think, good representation of pretty much all of the groups of conditions that are on the recommended uniform screening panel. I was surprised just by how many biotinidase patients are enrolled, um, and that continues to be a growing group. We have more work to do on that one. Um, this is to kind of, it's not because you, I want you to read everything that's on it, but it's to give you an idea of how the growth came across over about four years for all the disorders for which we have more than 10 cases. Um, there are a number of these, these disorders that all of you are familiar with that are vanishingly rare. We're just never going to have tons and tons of cases. And we are well below the 50 threshold for many disorders. But we're beginning to collect a significant number of cases for certain conditions. I'm going to go through some information that will show you kind of where we're going with that. Um, and tell you a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish with that. All right, this is kind of a, a sort of a summary of the scope of what we do in terms of data collection. Our, our researcher clinicians are in the states that are in the darker um, colors there. You can see it's pretty much uh, northern and uh, eastern side. Um, and so that, in my view, is a problem. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we go on through some of the data. That being said, we've had really excellent engagement from a large number of centers. Um, there's a lot of data elements in the LPDR, in the Longitudinal Pediatric Data Resource. Not every kid has every element that needs to be filled out. But at this point, when we did this particular figure, this was last fall, and we had more than 500,000 completed data fields, we have more than that now because people are continuing to enter. Um, just a word also, we have um, special data collection tools for pregnancy, transplant, and dialysis, special occasions that happen to a limited number of, of patients. Um, the way it's set up is if you enroll a patient, you automatically will see the standard entry materials and subsequent visits, but if they have um, experienced some of these extraordinary events, then um, they have the, we, you can collect data about them by assigning them that particular set of data elements. So um, the initial demographics is pretty extensive. And again, it sounds really, really big, but you don't fill out, if they don't have 12 siblings, then you don't fill out forms for 12 siblings. If they have none, you click no and you move on. So there's a lot of them that just don't. But there's, there's the opportunity to put in a lot of information. All right. Just some details, kind of, uh, this is again, um, we did a kind of data capture because we wanted to write this up a little bit so people would know a little bit about what that's going. It's the paper that um, is reflected in this data is, um, I think, in the May issue of Genetics and Medicine. Um, so we had pretty much even males and females at the time we took this snapshot. Our age range was from infancy to nearly 78 years of age. Um, you don't have to have been diagnosed by newborn screening to be in the data set. You just have to have a newborn screened disorder, which means that we have a fairly decent representation of adults who are diagnosed in other ways. This is really important because it gives us an even better idea about the, the true clinical presentations of some of these conditions. So that means that our average age is not all children. And we have about 10% representation of people who were entered after age 18 years. Um, the vast majority of the kids that are, of the people that are entered, though, are newborn screening only. There are a small subset that were clinical only, some with family members, and others, because of the way the question is set up, you can be newborn screened but also have a clinical presentation. An example would be a neonate who has citral anemia who uh, presents with hyperaminemia but has a newborn screen. 
they would have both things checked for ascertainment. Um, we had recorded nearly 4,000 visits. Um, there were 53 subjects that had more than 10 visits, which kind of reflects um, how uh, people are entering the data sequentially. So at that time, it was nearly 2,000 person years of follow-up, which we thought was kind of an exciting number. Um, about half of our subjects had uh, genetic testing results. I wish that was a lot higher. And there are certain disorders where it's very high. For example, in BLCAD deficiency, where people use that as part of the, they have a hard time sorting it out without the genetics. Those are pretty well represented. But there are some disorders where very few people had genetic testing. When we looked at the data set at that time, 87% of the subjects were identified as white, you, you know, to uh, match the NIH um, race categories. Um, we found that a little surprising and for us disconcerting. We, did, we wanted a representative sample and it didn't seem like that could possibly be represented. This is in part because 44% of our data is from children with MCAD deficiency or phenylketonuria, both of which are much more common in Caucasians. But we still saw this as being an important um, gap in our data. We don't have, I don't think, a very good snapshot of what the U.S. as a whole looks like. And so when you think about that map I showed you, we're missing a whole swath of very important demographics that would give us a more representative sample. All right, I'm just going to give you an example of how we use the information. I'm going to run you through what a project would look like, and then I'm going to show you just a little bit of the data that we've collected on specific subjects. Um, for example, there were a group, we, what we did was divide into research groups, and the clinicians um, that were in the groups characterized the questions and, and information they wanted to know about the disorders that we were collecting information on. And so this is an example of one of the projects on which uh, we're currently working, which was to have a better sense of how an unbiased random sample of patients with PKU is doing. So we wanted to know uh, what, the, what how old they were when they were diagnosed, um, were they newborn screened, what their phenylalanine level looked, how soon they were treated. You can see the things that were on there. Were they on were they on a separaterin, um, ever treated with alternative therapies? Do we have a genotype and so on? Whether and one of the things we thought would be a really important but very simple thing to know is are they growing? Are they gaining weight? And so that was the snapshot we wanted to to take. I'm going to show you what the data collection activity looks like. These are the different forms on which information is available for phenylketonuria. There's one for dialysis. If anybody ever gets dialyzed with PKU, I'll be amazed. But um, we have uniform availability for all disorders with these special ones. So, so same thing for transplant. I have to say, if you transplant a PKU kid, we sure would like people to enter data. Um, and that happens in funny ways, so it would be nice to collect it. PKU pregnancy, though, is really important. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the sort of demographics, and these are broken into little manageable pieces, so that's why it seems like there's so many. It makes it easier for us to sort the data when we get ready to pull it out. Um, all right, so this also looks intimidating, particularly because it has all these uh, dots, but I took a snapshot from our um, from our um, test field. So when somebody is actually entering an information on a subject, it's not all red stoplight kind of looking thing. Um, but these are the forms. And as you fill out the forms and then mark them as done, the, they, they come up as green dots instead. Or if you're partway through it and you want to go back to it or you want to check something, you leave it yellow. And um, so you do the intake information when you first see the child, and then you do that first visit if they're there with you at that time. Um, and so it, for the reason there's this long list of things is that the capability to have information at each visit is, is part of uh, the way that this is structured. Um, the pull-down menus look something like this. Um, you pull down your own center. You put down the date. Um, we keep track of somebody whether consent is there. There aren't very many um, disorders. Uh, there aren't very many required elements, which are the ones that would have like an asterisk or something like that. Um, but um, it, 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 it looks, if you see this as a printed page, pretty complicated when you're actually running through and putting it in, it's pretty easy to do. 
um, we collect information like how if they're if they happen to be uh, getting a specialized um, mode of nutrition delivery, for example, a G tube or a J tube, um, what kind of formula they're getting, and so on. And then we start collecting information. This is just an example at a visit what the nutrition form would start to look like. All right, so I'm going to give you some specific examples of conditions that we've looked at just to kind of give you some snapshots of the kind of data we've collected. Um, this is a table from the paper that I mentioned, and this is a specific question we wanted to ask about how our clinicians were responding to the designation or, or how they identified the designation of um, emergency care for children with critical versus non-critical conditions. Some of you may be familiar that the Society for Inherited Metabolic Diseases um, defined a set of disorders that are critical for call -up. They need immediate attention. And what we wanted to know was, did families have the tools they needed for critical conditions to uh, contact um, a primary provider and give specific information about care and how to connect with a specialty center so that they could get immediate support for their child's critical disorder. And it seems like this is, should be self-evident, but we were very happy to see that it was highly significant that clinicians recognized which disorders were most critical and were taking care of their patients by making sure that they had these critical tools such as sick days and emergency letters. This was a highly significant difference. Um, and while it seems sort of self-evident, it was something we were really felt was important to know. Were we really accomplishing some of the goals in care that we wanted to for these kids? So that's an example of the kind of analysis we were able to do on a general sort of overall data set, snapping, gave me a snapshot from all of the enrollees. We've also targeted by doing our specialized work groups certain specific disorders. So I'm going to snap, dig again, give you some snapshots from that. Um, we, everybody who takes care of metabolic diseases knows that there are certain headache disorders. I'm going to give you a couple examples of this. One of them is 3-methylcrotonyl-CoA carboxylase or 3-MCC deficiency. And um, there are a camp of people who think this is a non-disease and they shouldn't be paying, they don't need to pay attention to it, we shouldn't be screening for it. We wanted to look at the information we had because people were entering information with all of the caveats about the potential for bias or selection or whatever. In our 22 cases where we had enrollment for 3MCC, there were actually two children who had recurrent symptomatic events. One with recurrent lactic acidosis and hyperammonemia and the other one um, who had recurrent acidosis with illness. Four of the children actually had demonstrable uh, developmental delays in one or more domains. Um, we excluded kids who had explicit, explicit reasons to have developmental delays. For example, there's one child who had 3MCC and trisomy 21. Um, none of the kids had neonatal complications, and you couldn't tell from how high the C5-hydroxy uh, level, the newborn screening salient value was, whether they were going to have problems. All, many of the children on whom we had this piece of information had low carnitine, and all, uh, most of them were being supplemented with carnitine. I think our conclusion from this was that it was probably premature to say that this was a non-disease and shouldn't, it was a waste of time to gather information. And that sort of matches what others have observed. So I think the jury remains out on this one firmly, but we would be a little more in the probably ought to consider keeping track of these kids at least. The second disorder that's like that is FCAD deficiency, which is even more of a headache. So we went back and looked at these. We had 37 subjects, and many, many of them had had molecular testing. Um, when we looked at it, many of them had the known polymorphisms. There were children who did not have the known polymorphisms, but instead had um, were um, co primarily compound heterozygous for other um, mutations. And there was a medium range of follow-up for these kids. None of them were sick. None of them had died. They didn't have anything wrong on the profile of developmental disability, intellectual disability, hypotonia, all of the kinds of things that you might think of beta acid oxidation disorder. We don't know whether they didn't have any problems because everybody took real good care of them or gave them carnitine or treated them, 
But the bottom line was none of these kids, no matter what we looked at, um, had significant findings. I think this would be stronger evidence that this is not a very significant disorder. But I think continuing follow-up is probably warranted at least to keep a snapshot in, in place. If you, and what our rationale in including it was is if a state calls it out and the kid gets sent to you, then it really, it, the family deserves the opportunity to know how their kids continue to do compared to other children. Um, we were surprised by how many VLCAD kids we ended up ascertaining, and as time went on, it became clear that this was a more common disorder than would have been anticipated when, um, when people first started using MSMS. And so we had 52 in newborn screened diagnosed subjects on which we did um, an inquiry. Um, we found that none of them had maternal symptoms, and I'm guessing that the fatty liver pregnancy or HELP syndrome is not very specific or not very common in VLCAD deficiency. It seems to be more characteristic of other long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders. Almost all of our newborns that were diagnosed by newborn screening were asymptomatic. Two had cardiomyopathy. One of the points of difference between um, how kids are looked at um, in different regions and across the continents is the occurrence of rhabdomyolysis. And we actually found elevated CK to be relatively common and to first occur between ages one and three. Um, the diagram that's on this slide also shows you sort of the sequential events or uh, timing of elevation of CK, and it's on a logarithmic scale, so some of our subjects had remarkably high chronic elevations in CK. So it's a relatively common manifestation of the disorder. Um, diagnosis, as no one will be surprised to find out, was really complicated, required multiple modalities. Acyl carnitine and genotype seem to be the most common and were fairly, uh, in the overall analysis, most helpful. So that's, again, an example of what we could do. We were more densely populated with MCAD uh, deficient patients and had 221 subjects that had been newborn screened. Um, I don't know if this is high or low. We had some outliers, but it seemed like the age of notification of seven days was a little on the high side. I think all of us would like that to be a little shorter. We found when we analyzed the timing for their first visit with somebody that if they had a high C8 value, it was likely identified as being concerning and resulted in higher subspecialist, uh, an earlier subspecialist visit. We found that the C8 values, the sentinel values for newborn screening were significantly higher in symptomatic newborns with abnormal labs and who had severe mutations, including the common MCAD mutation. Um, children who had abnormal symptoms or who had abnormal labs were much more likely to have at least one of this common mutation. And we are, one of our important conclusions from this was that C8 levels and genotype are very significant predictors of uh, neonatal presentations. We, th we thought that was important because some, many, some newborn screening labs only report this as positive but without a numeric value. And I think that the numeric value is actually very significant for planning of management. If you have a kid with a high C8, it's really significant. And also um, in those states where um, they have made the decision to also do screening genotypes, um, these are really important to know because if they have a severe mutation, the risk that that child will have um, neonatal presentation is, is higher. Um, so those are some snapshots of some of the things that we were interested in trying to learn about. We're happy with the uh, sort of interim progress, but there are remain challenges to continuing this. It's expensive to collect data. Um, people's time, you know, time is money, the old saw, but it's really true. And so data collection is, is an intense event. Um, we have to spend a lot of time making sure that the data is as good as it can be, that we have um, complete entries, that it's accurate, um, and, you have a very fine line of having too much, if everybody has all these things they want to know, but the more you add to it, the more complicated it gets. And so how much data collection is too much? So those are all things that we wrestle with and struggle with on a continuing basis um, as we try to continue to expand and learn more about this data uh, set.
All right, let's see, what have I got here? Just so people know, this is the public face of um, our Inborn Areas of Metabolism Collaborative. It has bits and pieces of information, and people are welcome to look at that. It also has contact information, particularly if people are interested in, in potentially participating in uh, um, adding data to this data set. Um, I want to take just a minute to acknowledge the, some very important people who've participated in all of this. Um, Cindy Cameron is my uh, project co-PI um, at the Michigan Public Health Institute. We have been working together since this started when she was the head of the Region 4 Genetics Collaborative. And um, I, we're kind of complementary people because <laughs> uh, she is extremely informed in the social sciences and I try and provide the, the clinical expertise that will make this data uh, collection meaningful. You've heard about Sally and Matt, who are critical um, um, participants and um, active uh, workers in all of this. Uh, Xiaoyi Zai is our project statistician. We have an excellent staff at MPHI as well. Um, I also want to, I should have this on here, I used to, I forgot to put it in, a list of all of the really outstanding clinicians who have given so much time and energy and effort to making sure the data is meaningful, to collecting it, and to sharing it and working together in our collaborative groups. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions if there's a mechanism for doing that. Um, we're happy to hear from all of you as well. Um, Matt, anything that you wanted to add? Um, um, no, I don't think so, not specifically. I think uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, though, that people might have. Matt is our data guru. He knows as probably almost all of those 600,000 elements one by one. Hard to say that anybody would would want to spend all their time knowing 600,000 individual data pieces, but if anybody does, it's Matt. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming through. I can go ahead and um, put everybody in a mode where they can just speak into their microphones or phones. So I'm gonna do that. If you don't wish to talk, you might want to mute your phone or computer. I'm going to stop the sharing too here. Okay. I'm seeing that everyone can see my office. <laughs> Okay, so I'm still not seeing any questions come through. It's a little hard to do questions in this format. I totally acknowledge that, but we're absolutely happy to hear from anybody offline, by phone, by email. Um, I don't think that dog sleds would work very well, but any method that you wish to choose <laughs> to connect with us and ask questions about this. Um, we are both, we are happy both to receive um, input from people who might wish to, um, to contribute data or people who are interested in some kind of analysis of certain questions. Um, we can either, those analyses, we, we, if they're research-based, um, we have a process by which people can essentially submit questions and uh, we go through a process to sort of sharpen and refine the question so that we can make sure that the data elements that, that we have will answer the question in the way they want or make suggestions about how it can and then can provide data sets. Uh, we encourage collaboration if someone it submits a question that's something we're already working on, including them in um, an inquiry like that. Um, We've also occasionally done, if people have some pressing clinical question that they just need to know really quickly. One, we, an example is um, I was, uh, we were asked at one point um, how many people were um, offering audiology for kids with biotinidase. 
They just wanted a snapshot because a family had asked. And, you know, that was a, a, an inquiry that we could, one, accomplish very quickly, and two, um, could be part of a research question, but for the purposes of what they wanted, we just took a snapshot and let them know. So there are a lot of different ways this can be used. I'm also going to just mention um, that uh, the data information, um, the, the regional, the, the National Coordinating Center has an ongoing project that's taking place right now where they've selected um, a limited number of the um, uh, questions that we have for uh, long-term follow-up, a very limited data set to make it feasible, and are working on a pilot with selected states to enter those in a public health venue um, with uh, more complete ascertainment um, to see our, our our goal always was to have this be useful for both public health and for clinical and research purposes. And so we're excited that that is um, also ongoing. So um, those states that have kids enrolled from our group, we can actually create a report with that information for them. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you so much for all that information. I think it was a really excellent overview, and I think a lot of people will be able to take information from this, and hopefully you'll be hearing from our clinicians in our region. <laughs> um, and so we'll, this uh, webinar was recorded, so we'll post this to our YouTube station, and um, we'll also put a link to um, the Inborn Areas of Metabolism Collaborative website so they have uh, quick access to get to you. Um, one suggestion, you might also want to put a link to the LPDR because okay. people can actually go in and uh, there's a mechanism where you sort of sign up and if you basically have the right kind of email address, you can have sort of access to look at the data sets in more detail. Um, and so that's uh, another way that people can learn a little bit more because what's there for LPDR is the data collection tools we're using. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Susan and Matt and Sally. We appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.